There's been so much hype over the last couple of years about 2012 and the Mayan prophecies that a lot of people bought into that and now they're sitting back going, well, nothing happened. I got what I need. I'm okay. Because very few people actually took the time to study what was going on with the Mayan prophecies. The Mayans never prophesied the end of the world, ever, ever. At no point in time do we find in any of the codex from the mines do we find anything dealing with volcanoes and earthquakes and high tides and tsunamis and the world shaking to and fro. It's not there. What we did find is that at the end of their calendar, we would approach and see the end of an age, an end of an age that is 3,647 years long. At 1100 UTC on December 23rd, when the Mayan calendar came to an end, not December 21st. At 1100 UTC, December 23rd, an event took place that only takes place once every 255 million years. The sun rotates around a megastar called Solarius. Solarius rotates around a megastar called Palladius. Palladius rotates around the Milky Way. And at 1100 UTC, December 23rd, Palladius completed its 255 million year journey around the Milky Way. Now, why is that so important to us? I'll tell you. We're taught in school, incorrectly I might add, we're taught in school that the sun sits here and we rotate around the sun, right? And that is true, but that's not the rest of the story. The rest of the story is that we rotate around the sun, right? Solarius, our sun rotates around Solarius in, a, in an opposite direction. Palladius, Solarius rotates around Palladius in an opposite direction and the sun rotates around Sirius. Milky Way, Palladius rotates in an opposite direction around the Milky Way, and the Solaris rotates around Palladius. So in reality, if we're rotating around another star, then how can our sun just be sitting there while we rotate around it? It doesn't. In reality, the sun is moving through the solar system, and we're spiraling around it at 382,000 miles an hour. That's what our science classes leave out. Now, why is that so important? Fortunately, I'm going to tell you, okay? Because we rotate one way, the sun rotates a different way, Solarius rotates a different way, and Palladius rotates a different way. In reality, what happens is as we're spiraling through the universe, following the sun, we get to a point where we stop and we go this way and then this way. So if you picture a giant clock, and in the center of that giant clock, a, a smaller clock, we're actually spiraling through the solar system, going from 1 o'clock to 1 o'clock to 2 o'clock to 2 o'clock to 3 o'clock to 3 o'clock to 4 o'clock to 4 o'clock. We're zigging and zagging through the solar system. Why is this important? Somebody asked me. Come on, guys. This, there we go. This is an interactive conversation, guys. The reason this is so important is this. As we're traveling through the solar system, when we go from the zig point to the zag point to get back to the zig point, from zig to zag is 3,647 years. We're going to come back to that. If you look at our weather patterns over the last three years, you see an emerging habit, okay? The weather is changing. Areas that are never affected by any type of natural catastrophe are now being affected. We're seeing it a lot more with the earthquakes, the tornadoes, the winter storms, the hurricanes affecting majorly populated areas than we ever have before. Why is this? <laughs> That's not it. Close, though. Close. Very close, actually. If you just said suburban, you know. No. Um, really what's happening, guys, is that, and I'm going to shift gears before I answer that. Our physical poles exist in the location that our physical poles exist in because in 1903, when we sent expeditions to the North Pole and South Pole, they found the exact magnetic north and the exact magnetic south. They planted a little flag and they said, okay, this is north and south. Okay. What they fail to take into concept is that our magnetic poles are in a constant state of movement. All right? We experienced in October of last year a magnetic pole shift, or rather the completion of a magnetic pole shift. We are the only planet in our solar system that cannot, physically cannot, have a physical pole shift. The reason we physically cannot have a pole shift is because we have a molten core that is in a constant state of movement that is surrounded by air that's then surrounded, or empty pocket I should say, 
that's in surrounded by a solid ball of rock that's surrounded by pockets of air that is isn't surrounded by another ball of rock that we happen to live on top of. So because it's a constant movement of the ball inside, our physical poles can never change. Every planet in our solar system, including our moon, had a pole shift last year from the beginning of July to the end of, end of October. Every one of them. We caught Jupiter's, Saturn's, and Uranus's pole shifts on video. If you want to see something really cool, you can go to nasa.gov and check them out. Really cool. Okay, Our moon, every picture that's ever been taken of the moon has the bright spot on the moon at about the 515 location. And since October of last year, it's now at the 330 location. And nobody's saying anything about it. They're not saying anything about it because nobody wants to know about it. Nobody wants to know about it because we're too busy watching Honey Boo Boo or paying attention to, are they coming to take our guns, right? The reason this is important is this. From 1903 to 1972, our magnetic poles moved 42 miles. From 1972 to 1994, our magnetic poles moved 44 miles. From 94 to 2001, our magnetic poles moved 40 some odd miles. Y'all seen a pattern here, right? Shorter time, same distance, to the point where 2008, 2009, 2010, 2011, 2012, our magnetic poles moved an average of 43 and a half miles a year to complete a 37.6 degree movement. Now, why is this so important? Come on, somebody help me out here. Why is it so important? Thank you for playing. The reason it's so important is this. Our magnetic poles are the direct location that the holes in our magnetic sphere center themselves over. Okay. Our atmosphere, our stratosphere are solid spheres, but our magnetosphere is not. Our magnetosphere is actually two halves that come together. Okay. Where they come together at, at the exact magnetic north and exact magnetic south, they have holes. Everybody understands this. Anybody that's ever tried to look through the conspiracy of, ooh, the poles are going to shift and the world's going to end. You've seen enough of the data on it, researched enough of the data to understand that where those two halves come together, we have holes. Matter of fact, NASA's got some pretty cool data on it where it actually shows the solar radiation coming around and centering in the center. Now, the reason this is so important is this. When we get hit with a CME or a coronal mass ejection, got the two halves, sun's way over here somewhere, we get smacked with an earth-facing CME, what happens is the side that is sun-facing flattens out and elongates. Similar to you're holding a shield in front of somebody with a fire hose on you, right? The water's not hitting you directly, but it's coming up and over and getting your head wet, and it's going underneath and getting your feet wet. So when a CME hits the earth, the, the side of the magnetosphere that's sun facing flattens out and elongates. The opposite side gets drug out like a, like a long-haired woman's hair in a convertible, okay? The reason that's so important is because when that happens, those holes get bigger. Now, typically, where the danger comes in from solar activity is not so much in the CME, regardless of the size flares. We all worry about the X-class flares. It's going to destroy our satellites. Okay. It's not the X-class flare that destroys our satellites. It's a series of events. And this is what we're coming to. When a CME hits the Earth, it, el it flattens out the one side, elongates the other one, opens up these holes in the top and the bottom. If that's followed by solar radiation from a coronal hole, we're in trouble. That's when you start seeing, instead of the mega quakes that followed the CME being a 6.8, 6.9, 7.0, instead you see them as 7.6 and 7.7 7.8, like what recently hit Iran. This happens because we're getting bombarded with intense radiation. So how does this affect us here today? Very simple. Our magnetic poles completed their 37.6 degree journey which is why all of our airports now, anybody fly? Anybody a pilot? All the pilots are upset because all of the, air, the runways are now being renumbered. Runway number one at every airport in the world is always true magnetic north, always. And now all of the runways are being, being repainted, renumbered to where number three is now number one. So it goes number three because our poles have shifted and it's fluctuate and changed everything. The reason that's such a problem for us is this. With a changing magnetosphere, when the holes in the magnetosphere move to a new location, 
it changes our weather. That's why we have three week, or 11 months, three weeks, and four days of Chicago, Illinois, never having more than one inch of snow on the ground. And the last three weeks of that, Dallas, Texas got hit with six inches. That's why we see hurricanes hitting New York two years in a row in New Jersey instead of Florida and Louisiana, okay? It's why we've seen so many things that we've never seen before. Areas that get snow once every two, three hundred years getting, you know, several inches a week for five weeks. With the changing of the magnetosphere, with the change in the magnetic poles, everything else on Earth has changed. And we need to be aware of that. And the reason we need to be aware of that because there are things that follow when this happens. Archaeology, history, science. The Bible all tell us the same thing. When we combine these four things together, we see patterns emerge. I like to talk about the chaos theory. Chaos theory is everything's chaotic, right? But even in the midst of, of that chaos, if you become still and you become focused and you stare into that chaos, eventually you'll start to see the patterns develop. And when you see those patterns develop, you'll see the beauty in what's going on amidst the chaos. And right now, our planet is in a very chaotic state. And we gotta stop. We gotta take a deep breath. We gotta turn off the TV. We gotta focus on what's going on. And when you focus on what's going on and you peer into that, that chaos, what you'll see is that we are entering the 3647th year of our cycle. And a number of things are about to take place. One, every 3647 years, all 88 cycles that the Earth goes through, whether it's El Nino, El Nino, the high temps, the low temps, the mini ice ages, the, high, uh, the, the highs, all that kind of good stuff, all 88 cycles that the Earth goes through takes place once in a nine-month window every 3,647 3, years. The reason this is of concern to us is because we're all sitting back going, well, you know, last year was a pretty bad drought and we lost 70% of our crops, but we're okay. And none of us are taking into account that this year there's 11 weeks in July where the average temperature nationwide is going to be 111 degrees for three weeks. 111 degrees. It's going to make last year's drought look like a flood. But we're not paying attention to that. More importantly, we're not preparing for it. Okay? We're not looking at the fact that up until two years ago, there were an average of 119 6.0 or higher earthquakes worldwide a year. We have hundreds of earthquakes a day, right? But the 6.0 and higher are the ones that we're always concerned about, especially if they're real deep to the point where they become core quakes. We'll come back to that one in a minute. Now, for the last year and a half to two years, we've been averaging more than 150, 5.8 or higher earthquakes every quarter. That's a lot. We've gone to the point now where in three months we have almost twice as many higher magnitude earthquakes than we used to have in a year on average. We have areas all over the world where we're breaking snow records, we're breaking ice records, and we're breaking heat records all at the same time. How do we have four major uh, winter storms hit New Zealand at the same time that Australia is going through a drought and having wildfires all over the place? We don't know. What I do know is this, last year, 5.4 million Americans were displaced from their homes. 1.6 of them were displaced as some result of wildfires that were started from meteors hitting the earth. We've had more meteors in the last 18 months than we've, we've tracked more meteors coming into our atmosphere, impacting our planet in the last 18 months than we've tracked since 1828. That's a lot. We're seeing people being displaced from the home due to wildfires. We're seeing people displaced from the homes through storms knocking out power lines, the hottest week on record last year. And, and folks, let me kind of divert. When, when the news says today's the hottest, today we broke a heat record, what they mean is that today's April 25th, and since 1828, there's never been an April 25th that was hotter in this area than it was today. That's when we break a record. When they say on record, they mean period, any day of the year since 1828. And last July, the first week of July, was the hottest week in the United States on record. We had 3.4 million people without electricity. 680,000 of them went 14 days 
West Virginia. Food banks ran out. FEMA couldn't do anything to support them. West Virginia Emergency Management couldn't do anything to support them. The churches ran out of food. The governor's offices ran out of food. And people went hungry. And the locals were helping the locals and ignoring those that were traveling. 47,000 people stranded in three cities in West Virginia in hotels. Couldn't leave and go somewhere else because they couldn't get gas for their car because the gas stations didn't have electricity. Couldn't go to the grocery store and buy anything because the grocery stores were closed after day four because they didn't have any electricity and finally had to shut it down because people were running out of cash. The travelers couldn't go to the ATM and pull out cash because there was no electricity to run the banks. People went hungry. People borderline got to the point where they were starting to starve. People were hospitalized for lack of, of, of from thirst, medical, rela medical related issues from borderline dying of thirst. That happened right here in the United States of America. That happened on our watch. And nobody could do anything about it because there weren't any resources to provide for them. Now, if the United States government, after 14 days, has run out of resources for a confined area, and six months later still had not rebuilt those resources to the point where they could assist another confined area, what's going to happen when all of that happens at once? The odds of Hurricane Katrina hitting New Orleans, Hurricane Sandy hitting New York uh, City, the storm blowing through Ohio and Pennsylvania, uh, winter storm uh, Gandalf hitting the northeast coast, the whiteout that went across the, the Midwest, the wildfires happening in Colorado. The odds of those happening on any given year on the exact same day are astronomical to the point we're talking like trillions to one, except for 2013. The odds are greater than 30% that five or more major catastrophes could take place on the exact same day on 67 days this year. Our government's not prepared for that. And if we're waiting around for our government to do something about it, we're sadly mistaken and we're gonna be horribly disappointed. We have an obligation. I don't wanna sound sexist or, or macho or anything here for a second, so don't take it the wrong way. Men, you have an obligation to your wives, to your children, to your grandchildren, to your mothers, and to your fathers. You have an obligation to make sure that you are ready for anything that they are gonna go through because it's your responsibility to support them. That's your Christian responsibility. That's your responsibility as a man. As preppers, a lot of us like to say, my neighbors are unimportant. When we're on limited supply, it's my family and that's it. And that's the wrong way of thinking. We have a responsibility to help those in our neighborhoods, in our communities. We have a responsibility to help those in our church. Jerry and I were talking earlier with, where are we at, Steve? Steve, right, okay, and who else was, Jason was there. And we were talking about, uh, what's the name of that movie? We Were Soldiers, We Were Soldiers. And one of my favorite lines in that show comes after Colonel Hal Morris tells all the officers, you know, that in the Cherokee nations, every woman, every elderly woman was called mom and every elderly man was called grandfather. And of course the Sergeant Major turns and says something to the rest of the officers and basically I'll clean it up and you know, you ever call me grandfather, I'll kill you, you know. But the truth of that is this, we have a responsibility, not just to ourselves, not just to our families, but to all of the grandfathers and all of the mothers. Now, if it means giving to a stranger and taking out of the mouth of your child, no, your child comes first. If it means taking out of your mouth to give to your child, yes, your child comes first. There's a hierarchy. My wife understands the hierarchy in our family, and she supports that hierarchy. My children, my wife, myself, my neighbors, my loved ones. I can't help anybody if I'm dead, right? but yet my responsibility is my wife and my children. And that's all of our responsibilities as well. 